to this, uh, what, proves, what will prove to be a very interesting session with Will McCants. Uh, before we get started with that, uh, first of all, I'll welcome you on behalf of the Center for International Studies, which has organized this event. I'm John Tierman, uh, Executive Director of the Center, and I want to point out a couple of uh, events coming up which may interest you. Uh, the first one will be a star forum on uh, the global refugee crisis. That's on October 21st, a Wednesday, uh, in E25, room 111. That's the medical building, right? Next to the medical, MIT Medical. Uh, Jennifer Leaning uh, from Harvard, uh, Serena Perek. Not sure how to pronounce that at uh, Northeastern, and uh, two uh, people from Oxfam should be a good session on this. Uh, there are seats down here, people. If you don't want to sit on the floor, there are plenty of seats down here. Um, so that's the that's the next star forum, and then on November 9th at 7 p.m. in in the Kirsch Auditorium. Uh, we have a film, a documentary called Partner with the Enemy about the women in uh, Israeli and Palestinian women working uh, on behalf of peace, I think. Um, you can always get our events on our website, and we have a calendar on the website. You can check that out. Uh, today, uh, we have, as I said, Will McCants uh, speaking about his new book and his, uh, the subject of ISIS, which is on everybody's agenda these days. Um, his book is being sold here in the back, and there will be a book signing after uh, the talk. Uh, so you're welcome to stick around and buy a book and get it signed. Um, will will speak for about 30 minutes. And then we will take some questions from all of you. If you would go to the microphones on either side, it would be helpful because we are having this videotaped and want to be sure to capture your words of wisdom, which we hope will be in the form of a short question. But you can be wise in a short question. Uh, William McCants is a fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy and director of its project on U.S. relations with the Islamic world at the Brookings Institution. He's adjunct faculty at Johns Hopkins and has held various uh, government think tank positions related to Islam, the Mid Middle East, and terrorism. He was in the State Department for two years, uh, from uh, 2009 to 2011, senior advisor for countering violent extremism. And he has held a long list of other uh, things, uh, jobs, and responsibilities. He's written quite a bit. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that this book has gotten as much positive buzz as I've seen on a book about uh, these kinds of topics in a long, long time. So uh, our expectations are high. Please. Uh, <laughs> Please help me welcome Will McCants. Thank you, John, and thank you to the Center and the Star Forum for having me. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, just trying to think about what to, what to talk about tonight. There's so many different facets of the Islamic State that are interesting. Some more interesting to me as a historian uh, than they would be, I think, to uh, the lay person. Uh, but I think uppermost question on everyone's mind, regardless of their background, is how has this organization been so successful? Uh, if you measure success by control of territory, establishing a government, staring down one of the most powerful militaries on earth, a decent measure of success, I think, for anyone. How has it been so successful? And I asked myself this question in the context of its earlier 
ignominious, outright defeat in 2008, 2009? How is it that an organization that was defeated so soundly just a few years prior makes a roaring comeback and is able to take so much territory despite the wishes of the people who live in that territory and despite the wishes of the governments that are surrounding it. So that's the question I want to answer tonight. Um, I come at this from a little bit of a different angle uh, than most people. Uh, my training is as an intellectual historian, so of course I tend to put a very high value on ideas. And when you're looking at militant organizations, um, it's not always apparent um, that ideas matter too much. And particularly when you get to studying their tactics and their behavior, a lot of them can bleed together and look very similar regardless of their ideological makeup. So I want to make an argument to you tonight that for the Islamic State, uh, ideas have mattered a lot. Um, where they might not have mattered for some other groups. And then in the Q&A, you can pick apart my argument. Um, the Islamic State has a basic formula, which it has adhered to since its founding in 2006. I'll give you the formula, and then I'll walk us through it. The formula is establish God's kingdom on earth immediately, so caliphate now rather than later. Teaching and preaching that the end of the world is coming immediately, not later. So apocalypse now and not later. And they preach their own version of Machiavelli's dictum, it is better to be feared than to be loved. They have a very brutal style of insurgency and philosophy of government that cuts against uh, a hearts and minds approach that might be used by some other insurgent groups. So that's the basic formula, right? It is caliphate now, apocalypse now, and intense brutality. This is the formula they had when they declared themselves a state in 2006. It's the same basic formula they have today. Why, then, does the formula fail so badly in its early years and proves to be so much of a success in the group's later years? And I will argue that the change in political context had a lot to do with it. But also, their consistency in this formula gave them an edge in this change political context that the, others group, uh, the other groups lacked because they didn't have this particular configuration. So let's go back to the Islamic State's founding in 2006. As you can tell by its name, the organization thought of itself as a state in 2006, even though it did not control any territory. Its predecessor organization, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, at least controlled a few towns sometimes. But the Islamic State, when it established itself in October 2006, it didn't control any territory, yet it put out the message that it was a state. And it even if you go back and look carefully at their propaganda, both the written word, even the flag and it, the design that they chose, it wanted other Muslims to think of it also as the caliphate. They wouldn't quite come out and say it, but they were dropping a lot of hints that that's what it was. They called their emir the commander of the faithful, which in medieval Islam is a title reserved for the caliph. They talked about their flag as the caliphate's flag. Their flag has the seal, the stamp of the prophet on it, which was carried by the caliphs as a sign of their authority. The establishment of the Islamic State went against the wishes of Al-Qaeda Central. It went against the wishes of bin Laden and Zawahiri. Their philosophy was caliphate later. Their priorities were exactly the opposite. What's most important? First, get the West out of the Middle East, particularly the Americans. Carry out strikes in the American homeland until the Americans leave and their allies leave. 
Next, go after local regimes and remove them. Then finally, you can establish emirates and network them together to become the caliphate. So exactly the opposite of the Islamic State. And they strongly discourage the Islamic State from declaring itself as such and discourage them from moving to declare themselves a caliphate until they got the Americans out of Iraq and until they had built a broad base of support among Sunni Muslims. And you're going to see this as a theme throughout the discussion tonight, that in Al-Qaeda's mind, the key to victory always is winning over broad Muslim popular support. And their differences with the Islamic State mainly had to do with this question. How much do you need popular support in order to successfully prosecute an insurgency? and then govern. So they discouraged them from declaring an Islamic State. The Islamic State's leaders uh, did it without their knowledge. And we now have the inside uh, private letters that were being exchanged at the time between Al-Qaeda Central and the Islamic State. And we can see that Al-Qaeda's leaders were totally caught by surprise. So that's step one. Step two was the apocalyptic stuff. Now this is not an aspect of the Islamic State that anyone has focused on before. Um, and in general, militant groups that espouse apocalyptic ideas, people tend to look past the ideas and focus more on behavior. With good reason, because the behavior gives you a lot of insight. But sometimes, these groups that espouse apocalyptic ideas aren't just doing it for propaganda reasons. Sometimes they really believe it. And this is especially true of the early Islamic State. So I found some interesting letters uh, that had been exchanged between a chief judge who had been in the Islamic State in its early years and Al-Qaeda Central. And this chief judge was, in a sense, a whistleblower and was telling Al-Qaeda's leadership what had been going on. And one of the things he talks about at length in his letter is the fact that the Islamic State's founder, a guy by the name of Abu Ayyub al-Masri, that he was uh, apocalypse addled, that he totally and completely believed that a Muslim savior figure, the Mahdi, who's supposed to come at the end of time and restore justice to the world, that the Mahdi was going to appear at any moment. And this chief judge documents that in the first year of the Islamic State's existence, its leader was making decisions based on the apocalyptic timetable. The early establishment of the, of the, of the Islamic State was on an apocalyptic timetable. They rushed it because they believed the Mahdi was going to come any day and the proto-caliphate had to be there to greet him. They also sent their chief emirs across Iraq and had their forces spread out because they anticipated that the Mahdi would arrive at any moment and help them conquer the whole country. Now, of course, none of that pans out, and he's horribly humiliated as a consequence of it. But it just goes to show in that the Islamic State's very early days, its leadership was making some pretty big military decisions based on his apocalyptic beliefs. Al-Qaeda's leadership gets word of this and is furious uh, because Al-Qaeda's leadership is of an older generation of Sunnis and they're also more cosmopolitan, right? Zawahiri comes from an elite family in Cairo, Bin Laden from an elite family in Saudi Arabia. Upper class Sunnis tend to look down on this kind of stuff. And until the last decade, a lot of Sunnis look down on this kind of stuff. Yes, there are Islamic prophecies of the end times. Yes, the end of the world is going to come. But the only people that really get wound up about this, they would say, are the Shia. It's the Shia that get excited about this stuff. Right-thinking Sunnis, we don't really focus on this sort of thing. And then if you look at Zawahri and bin Laden, there was also a class element to it as well, that ah, this is something the riffraff do, not, not proper thinking, respectable folk. So they chastised the founder of the Islamic State for making decisions on an apocalyptic timetable, and they pointed out the obvious, 
that this is a terrible way to do military planning and you're leading your organization to disaster, cut it out. The third thing that really differentiated the Islamic State from Al-Qaeda was its focus on um, and its use of very brutal forms of violence and very um, visible forms of violence, televised violence. You'll remember that Zarqawi pioneered the beheading videos uh, soon after the Abu Ghraib revelations. He would dress prisoners in the orange jumpsuits like they were dressed in Abu Ghraib and deliver a message and then behead them. Um, he was waging a war against Shia civilians. Um, he was going after ordinary Sunnis and being very harsh in the implementation of the fixed punishments in Islamic scripture. All of this Al-Qaeda objected to. They wrote him about the Shia saying, look, if you want to go after the leadership, okay, that makes sense. They're working with the Americans, but don't go after the civilians. Um, they've done nothing wrong. Um, treat the Sunni population well. You propose to rule over them. We want to build a broad-based coalition with them. How can we ever hope uh, to rule this country one day if we've angered everyone that we hope to govern? Uh, and Zawahiri, in, in one letter chastising Zarqawi, even uses the language hearts and minds. The other point he makes is that this is a struggle in the media. And this is a war of perceptions. And we're trying to win over popular support. These beheading videos are a PR disaster. He says, you may be exciting young men by doing this, but you are horrifying normal Muslims. And it is tarnishing the Al-Qaeda name. And it is also undermining your insurgency. The combination of these three things seemed, at the time, to have been a recipe for disaster. Um, because if you look at what happened, uh, there was an uprising of Sunni Arab tribes, uh, particularly in Ambar province, helped by the American forces and the Shia-dominated government in Baghdad. And they put an end to any pretensions that the Islamic State may have had to actually be a state. The fact that the Islamic State insisted that others consider it a state really alienated the other Sunni rebels. They didn't want to bend a knee to this organization that didn't really control territory. Um, the fact that it was so focused on the apocalypse may, meant that it was making bad military decisions. And the fact that it was so brutal to the other insurgent groups, but also to the Sunni population, meant that they undermined their cause. So Western analysts from the outside saw and interpreted this as the Islamic State really sowed the seeds of its own demise. And this is also, incidentally, how bin Laden and Zawahiri read it as well, that you guys didn't listen. We told you about the brutality stuff told you about moving too quickly to statehood, um, you are reaping what you have sowed. And there's a number of letters in the, in, in the following years in which Zawahiri, bin Laden, and others hold up the Islamic State as an example of what not to do. So it's an, it's an appealing narrative. The one thing it elides, and I'll come back to this, the, the one thing it elides, though, is the fact that there was a very large American army present to work with the Sunni tribes that were rising up. So the Islamic State is, for all intents and purposes, really defeated as an insurgent organization by 2009. They have been pushed back underground still capable of carrying out some pretty big terror attacks, but were a, a classical clandestine terror organization by the time the new guy took over in 2010, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. What's interesting is that in the meantime, before the Islamic State makes its comeback, a number of al-Qaeda's affiliates 
rather than taking the lesson that the Islamic State had been foolish to try, they took the lesson that the Islamic State maybe hadn't tried hard enough. So in defiance of bin Laden's wishes, they began to attempt to establish their own emirates, their own states. And there's this fascinating correlation uh, that I document between when they adopt the Islamic State's flag and when they begin to wage an insurgency to establish their own state. So one group after another begins to take up its flag, not formally pledging allegiance, but taking up its flag. Then they take up its cause just months later. We see this happen in Yemen. It happens in Somalia with the Shabaab. It happens again in Mali. Everywhere there are security vacuums, you can see the Al-Qaeda affiliates begin to move in a similar direction. And it was driving bin Laden nuts. He was telling them, we're not ready for this. The plan is get the Americans out, get rid of these local governments, then we do this. But if you must do this, do it smart. Think about hearts and minds. If you are governing people, be lenient in your application of Islamic law. Don't just rush in and start chopping off hands. We'll get to it eventually. It's prescribed in Islamic scripture, but little by little. The people aren't going to be used to it. They're not going to be ready for it. Some of the groups accepted the advice. Some of them didn't. AQAP tried to hew closely to the advice. The Shabab, for example, went in the other direction. But they never quite get to finish running the experiment. Their states always fail. And they never can quite figure out, did they fail because we were too harsh? Or did they fail because we angered too many powerful outsiders? Because being global jihadists, they were always at least verbally threatening powerful neighbors and making powerful enemies, whether they had any intent behind it or not. So they were always inviting intervention. And so they're all eventually overthrown. So they can never quite decide which was the right way to go. Did the Islamic State have the right of it, or did bin Laden have the right of it? So then we come to 2011, 2012. Syria begins to descend into chaos, and the Islamic State sees an open. It's still been pushed underground in Iraq, but it's finding that it has much more freedom of action in the Sunni hinterland in eastern Syria. So here's where the formula comes into play again. While all the other rebel groups in Syria focus on overthrowing the existing government, the Islamic State focuses on establishing its own government. It thought of itself as a state. It was in the Sunni tribal heartland. It set about building that state. If you're Bashar al-Assad and you are prioritizing who you're going to go after first, who do you choose? The guys that are coming right after you in Damascus? Or are you going to go after the yahoos that are building a state in the countryside? You're going to go after the guys that are going after you. So there is an alignment of interests between the Islamic State and the Assad regime. And the Assad regime, 90% of its bombings were carried out against the rebels that were pressing in on Damascus and Aleppo and the other major cities. Very rarely did they go after the Islamic State. It was also a reason, a propaganda reason for leaving the Islamic State alone because Assad had an interest in cultivating a greater evil out there so he could frame the entire rebellion as one big terrorist movement. All that's to say that the Islamic State benefited a great deal by the fact that they didn't immediately go after the Assad regime, that they focused on state building. 
whereas the other rebels threw themselves into the melee. It also helped that they were waging a very brutal form of insurgency. I think we forget because of our experience over the past decade and the emphasis in the counterinsurgency community on hearts and minds being the center of the struggle. We forget just how many successful insurgencies have been fought and won by brutal insurgents who are very similar to the Islamic State, regardless of ideology, that really didn't care too much for winning over hearts and minds. They cared more about scaring the hell out of people. And they also adopted very brutal forms of government. And I think we would like, I would like to think that brutal governments sow the seeds of their own demise and that the people will ultimately rise up. But if you think about it, it's often not the case. But rather, the people are scared to death and absent finding a very powerful ally on the outside, they are unable or unwilling to rise up. It's also true that a brutal form of insurgency can be quite efficient in the short term. Uh, you cut through a lot of the red tape uh, when it's either you're on my team or you're dead. If you want a contrast, look at how Nusra operated. This is Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Syria, and it was following the Al-Qaeda line. Try and win over the hearts and minds of the Sunni Muslims collaborate with the other rebels, be sensitive to the needs of civilians. All of that makes a lot of sense if you're waging a hearts and minds style insurgency. But it also brings a lot of problems. In one city after another, uh, they proved to be inefficient and ineffective at governing. Why? Because they were too worried about working with the other groups consultation, making sure everybody's needs were taken care of, um, it led to a lot of chaos. Whereas the Islamic State, when it would go into a city, it would initially work with groups, but then gradually eliminate them and put itself in charge. And it became much more efficient than the other groups and subdued the population much more quickly. If you want historical examples of where this has worked, at least in the Muslim world, think about the Taliban. The Taliban waged a similar style of campaign. It governed in a similar way. And if you think about it, the Taliban would probably still be with us had it not angered the United States. There was no rebellion in the offing in Afghanistan. So this kind of insurgency can work, regrettably, and it can be enduring, regrettably. So caliphate now gives them a, a state and is somewhat aligned with Assad's interests, so they get a toehold. A brutal form of insurgency helps them establish it and run the state quickly and efficiently. What about the apocalyptic stuff? The Islamic State over time modified its apocalypticism because this early messianic stuff was, uh, like any sort of messianism, very unstable, right? If you think the Messiah is going to come every day, you're going to be making some very rash decisions. But it had also been a great boon in terms of recruiting foreign fighters. So you don't want to lose the appeal either. Uh, teaching people that the end of the world is right around the corner. And oh, by the way, all of the Islamic prophecies that say the end of the world is going to happen in Syria and Iraq, just look around. Look at the cataclysm. It, because of the political turmoil, that apocalyptic framework was ready-made. Now, the other groups would not use it. The other Sunni groups would downplay the apocalyptic stuff. The Islamic State is really unique in the Syrian insurgency and in the Iraqi insurgency in that they really play up the apocalyptic stuff in their propaganda. 
the name of their English language magazine directed towards English-speaking foreign fighters is called Dabit, which is the name of a tiny town outside of Aleppo where one prophecy says the final battle with the infidels is going to take place. So they use it as part of the recruiting pitch. But what did they do about the messianic stuff that had pr proven to be so destabilizing early in their history? How did they fix it? What happened over time is the Islamic State began to shift from the Mahdi as a fulfillment of prophecy to the appearance of the caliphate as, an, as the fulfillment of prophecy. So it focused then the foreign fighters who were excited about the fulfillment of prophecy, it focused them on state building. And at the same time, they are able to maintain um, the apocalyptic expectation that's drawing in so many foreign fighters. Now, how does this matter in, in practical terms? In practical terms, it means that because of, not solely because of, but largely because of this apocalyptic recruiting pitch um, and the emphasis on the return of the caliphate as a fulfillment of prophecy, they are able to pull in more foreign fighters than the other groups. And there is one report after another of journalists talking to young men and women going to the Islamic State, asking them, why are you going? Because the end times are here. And the caliphate has returned. Uh, there's a great article just last week uh, by Martin Chulov in The, in the Guardian uh, reporting the same thing. But this is, these kind of articles have been circulating for the last two or three years. It matters a lot. So they were able to then recruit these foreign fighters which means they were able to replenish their ranks. And they got an army of shock troops. Think about the utility of foreign fighters. Foreign fighters are not tied to the land. And they don't really have ties to the people. They might share a common religious identity, but they don't have the tribal ties. It's not their neighbors. If you want somebody to administer rough justice and to wage this kind of brutal insurgency, foreign fighters are very handy in the way that local fighters are not. So this basic formula then of caliphate now, apocalypse now, and brutality ends up being the formula for success over the past two years, whereas previously it had been a, a recipe for disaster. What had changed, of course, was the political context. The Sunnis in Iraq and in Syria had been alienated from their governments, no longer trusted them. They didn't particularly like the Islamic State but they also had nowhere else to turn. And the Islamic State then was very capable at suppressing any dissent, absence of a large military that was willing to really take them on. Um, so the upshot is that the Islamic State has demonstrated a model for other jihadists to follow. And my worry is that because of the spread of chaos in the Middle East, in the Arabic speaking world, that you are going to see more and more jihadist insurgencies adopt the Islamic State's model rather than trying to hew to the Al Qaeda model of hearts and minds, which I think means at the end of the day, you're going to see far more brutal insurgencies in the future. So I'm happy to take questions on that very downer note, and I'll try and find a way to bring us up. I think if you have questions, you're supposed to make your way to the mics. Don't all rush at once, I know.
Hello, Will. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Um, so I, I've been wondering about one thing, you know, in this, the now aspect of all this. Um, do you have any sense that, um, that, 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 that they have to keep advancing? In other words, if they don't keep attacking and winning, that the air goes out of the balloon somehow? So, as, and as they sort of come up to in their, in, their, in their expansion, they've come up to centers and groups of folk that are actually willing to brawl, not like them, not easy to absorb. It seems like the wave is breaking on shoals. So it seems to be breaking on Shiite shoals in mm -hmm. Iraq. It seems to be breaking on Kurdish shoals. Some of that is backed by us. Right, so what happens if you know that the 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 dynamism kind of peters out? So the foreign fighters are coming; they're expecting action, and nothing much is happening. And every time they go to fight, with basically they get hit by massive numbers of airstrikes, and all. So so the success goes out of the thing. Do you think the organization can take this? Can it roll with the punches, or is it likely to have deep contradictions? Right. Thanks. So. The Islamic State has a two-word slogan uh, that directly bears on your point, Barry. And the two-word slogan is enduring, expanding. Both of those have to do with survival and momentum, controlling territory and pushing it out. So you can see then that the Islamic State's legitimacy is very much tied to the control of territory and its constant expansion. And you take that away from them, you remove the success, you strike at the heart of their legitimacy. But it's easier said than done. I would note back in 2009 when the Islamic State never controlled any territory and they had been pushed back underground as an insurgency, other Al Qaeda affiliates took up its flag and its project. So it mitigated the damage uh, to its credibility because others took up its flag, uh, metaphorically and literally. The Islamic State is pursuing a similar mitigation strategy, and that's why you have this phenomenon of the franchising happening, uh, where you have other uh, jihadist groups, uh, some of them major, some of them no names, uh, who are also taking up the Islamic State flag. Um, this does not, so far as we know, have to do with um, raising new human or uh, financial resources because those groups are not contributing much to ISIS, Syria and Iraq. But it's a way to keep scoring new propaganda victories and to mitigate any potential territorial loss in their future. Yes, please. Um, thank you for your analysis. Uh, so one of the most disturbing things about ISIS, in my opinion, is how successful they are at recruiting. And, you know, in particular, like the diversity and how widespread the recruiting efforts have become. And, you know, I just give you one example. Like last year, you know, I'm, I'm Egyptian and last year, you know, this in the lack of a better word, this hipster, you know, middle-class Egyptian guy, Islam Yakin, who just left his life in, you know, suburban Cairo um, to join ISIS and became just like a, you know, a, a phenomenon. And it's not a unique phenomenon. It happened from like people coming from Western countries, coming from Europe, from the U.S. So, you know, what do you think is the, the thing that these uh, recruitment efforts is tapping to, and you know how can be done. What what can be done to sort of curb this uh, sort of phenomenon? Yeah, thank you. Um, the Islamic State's recruitment and its messaging strategy is different from Al Qaeda's. Al Qaeda's, as I said, had focused for its whole history on trying to win over broad Muslim popular support for its effort. And so the US government had a basic understanding of what to do in response. Not always good at executing, but had a basic understanding if your opponent is trying to get their poll numbers up, 
with the masses, the goal for you is to drive them down. Um, the, that's not the Islamic State's game. The Islamic State is not trying to cultivate broad popular Muslim support. It is appealing to a very narrow segment of the population, namely and primarily young men who get excited about the kind of violence that it's perpetrating because it needs those kind of young men to wage the sort of brutal insurgency that it's waging. And it's difficult then, given that they are narrow casting in that way, it's difficult to formulate a response. Um, I think one of the best responses I've seen is uh, getting the stories out of people who have defected from the Islamic State, who are giving a real window into how the group actually operates, but it's a real challenge. And the motives for people going, you know, are very idiosyncratic. But the Islamic State has this field of dreams approach. If you build it, they will come, and they will read into your project whatever hopes and desires they may have. But their emphasis is on rebuilding God's kingdom on earth and coming to a land where finally authentic Islam is going to be practiced. And so people respond for a variety of reasons. In the West, I think there's something a little bit different going on. And I think that is um, the Islamic State has cultivated its countercultural appeal. Um, it has embraced its pariah status. And so if you're a young Muslim in the West looking for a way to rebel, not just against the dominant culture, but your parents' Islam and mainstream Islam, what could be more countercultural and offensive to everybody than joining the Islamic State? So I think that's part of the perverse appeal as well. Yes, please. Uh, well, first I'd like to say it's nice to see a, another historian on this campus. It's, it's pretty rare. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, I'm a coach here, so. Uh, anyways, um, I actually, before I came to this talk, had planned a myriad of things I'd like to ask, but in, in, in light of recent events, uh, I would just like to, to know your thoughts on, I mean, I, myself, because I, sort of know the history of the region. I, I think I know why the Obama administration uh, kind of kept out of Syria for a while. Uh, obviously with the recent developments with Russia starting airstrikes within the last 48 hours. Um, in your opinion, now that Russia has basically stepped up their involvement in Syria, um, and despite the fact that the first airstrikes weren't according to a lot of experts, ISIS targets. Um, do you think this is going to help precipitate the end of ISIS, or do you think it will have no difference, or do you think it might actually make them stronger? Um, I, think, I think it's either it makes no difference or it makes them slightly stronger, because Russia's primary interest is shoring up the Assad regime and its stronghold along the Mediterranean coast. Um, it's framing this as an anti-ISIS campaign to justify its military involvement, but that's not really the game. And as you said, we can see from where they're striking that it's focused primarily on rebels that are fighting Assad, but close in to territory that, he matter, that matters to him, Damascus and uh, Latakia. So it doesn't do much to damage the Islamic State. And if anything, if the pace of airstrikes on the rebels continues, it will weaken uh, those rebels, not that are just fighting against Assad, but are also fighting against the Islamic State. So it could be a windfall for them as well. Let's say they start eliminating a lot of Assad's rebels 
okay? Uh, do you think perhaps Russia might screw it a little bit more and actually start generally attacking ISIS? Right, so the, the question is if they succeed or make headway against the rebels that threaten Assad, would they turn against the Islamic State? Um, yeah, eventually, if they want to reconstitute Syria, they would have to. I mean, but the, the reason why the Islamic State persists is it is nobody's top priority among the countries and groups that ring the Islamic State, with the possible exception of Jordan. Now, it's a priority, but it is not a top priority. It's a top priority for the United States and Europe, but for no one that surrounds it. So it continues to persist while everybody else is pursuing their top priorities. Yes, please. I'm not a historian, um, but I like history. And one thing that's disturbed me is the kind of ahistoricity that, that the United States has indulged in. Um, so for instance, the Caliphate movement of the 1920s barely mentioned in any of the reportage on what's been happening since 2001. Abdul Ghaffar Khan and the Khude Hitmagar, who I think in some way was an example to the Taliban. Khan establishing schools and 20 years later establishing what some call the world's first nonviolent army. And these kinds of strains in history, the Caliphate movement after World War I, and the Islamic nonviolence of Abdul Rahman seem to be completely forgotten. Is 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 my am I right in that? Is does any of that have any relevance to today? Um, I can tell you that I mentioned the Caliphate movement in my book, <laughs> so if that, if that if that covers me, um, yeah, certainly certainly it has relevance, um, and you know one of the things I try to do in the book is is to point out that the way the Islamic State does things and the way that the Islamic State justifies the things that it does are not done by others, right? So you have the same political context, but you have a variety of responses to that context by pious Muslims and impious Muslims. And I think the contrast, is, as you're alluding to, the contrast is useful because you're able to tease out then what is unique about the Islamic State and what it shares uh, with, uh, with the others that are pushing for change. Yes, please. Is there evidence that uh, wealthy donors in, in countries like Saudi Arabia and the Emirates have helped fund ISIS and get, get it uh, to a stronger position? Um, there is not a lot of evidence, actually. This is something I followed really closely. Um, uh, and it turns out that the, fund, the, the wealthy private donors uh, in the Gulf uh, have sent most of their money to the ultra-conservative Islamists that are fighting, but that are not ISIS. So Nusra, Ahrar al-Sham, the other major parts of the Sunni rebellion, the ultra-conservatives, that's where the money's going. And it had been quite public. Um, and a lot of it had been transiting through banks in Kuwait because their counter-terror finance laws were terrible. And the U.S. Treasury really lashed them for it in public and they made some positive changes. But that's where the money went. The Islamic State, um, since its founding in 2006, has been very good at cultivating local sources of revenue. They are great at extortion, uh, kidnapping for ransom, uh, they've now uh, acquired some oil fields. Um, but like any state, they raise most of their money now from taxes. Uh, so the people who really track Islamic State finances closely say they get next to nothing from the outside, actually, which makes it so difficult then for us to turn off the money because there's no spigot to turn off. They have their own. Please. Hi. So a few weeks ago, I uh, read an article talking about the effect of the European refugee crisis on ISIS. And of course, some people speculate that there are ISIS militants infiltrating in the refugee coming into Europe. 
My question is, how likely is that in terms of, as you said, ISIS focus is on building the caliphate, not so much on killing off the West now. Right. So how likely is it that they're trying to expand or infiltrating into the West through the refugee? Thank you. Um, so there have been a number of reports, uh, journalists talking to Islamic State operatives and asking them, you know, are you trying to get people into the West? And the operatives say, yes, we've gotten thousands into the West. But the problem is there's been no evidence of it yet. So it's, it's difficult to parse then. Is this really happening? And is this something we should uh, uh, be worried about? Um, or is this just more disinformation and propaganda? And really, the intelligence community is the one that's ultimately going to have to to figure it out uh, because it is, you know, it is being done in secret if it's being done at all. Um, I would highlight a, a different worry um, that I have, and that's not that Islamic State fighters are coming in, although should be concerned and vigilant, but it's rather that the refugees that are coming, um, many of them are going to experience, especially the young people, severe dislocation. It will be a very hard for them to assimilate in these societies. The more refugees that are taken in, of course, the political discourse will become more toxic surround it. This is a very ripe recruiting ground for extremists that are already in Europe. So my worry is not necessarily that the extremists are coming in, but the extremists that are already in there are going to find this a, a, a good opportunity to recruit and send the recruits in the, in the opposite direction. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your lecture. And uh, uh, before I came to MIT last month, I was working in Iraq for three years. Yeah, but uh, in South region, so it's relatively safe. So right. from there, I look at how ISIS starting from zero and then took most of the place on Northwest. So I'm particularly interested on the effect of ISIS on the Iraqi, like uh, as a country, mm. because before it was Kurdistan in the north and central government and South is mostly Shia areas. Uh, once ISIS started to took a lot of place, I can feel that actually all the groups from North, from central government, from South, they are more like working together towards ISIS. So do you think that ISIS is like a positive thing for uh, Iraq as a country, maybe helping them to unite more? Or you think this is just the current situation, once ISIS threatened was gone, there will be maybe even more split? That's Thank a you. good counterintuitive point, though. I could just see it in foreignpolicy.com. Um, uh, in the short term, right. The, the North, the South, they have to collaborate. The Kurds and the Shia have to work together. But what the Islamic State has done is really almost the, the de facto partition of Iraq. And you can even see this in the fact that the government still continues to pay the salaries of government employees who are living in ISIS land but yet they don't control the land at all. I mean, it's, it's almost as if the, the, the federalism has come into being. So I, to me, I think this hastens, um, if not the breakup of Iraq, then the, the further decentralization of the country in the long term. Yeah, so I will have, I will have a question about the history part of your title. So as you, as you said before, like we, in the report, people don't really talk about uh, the Islamic State Part One, which started like 2006, seven, eight, which was not really a state, but the kind of. So my question is about the period, the interim period between, um, let's say, 2011 when the crisis here started, and then 2014 when they took out Mosul. Um, there were many reports that saying. They were saying journal, I mean journal reports that the Islamic State is like coming back. Mm -hmm. And it was totally ignored by US government, all of the Western governments. They took uh, Raqqa from the rebels, no intervention whatsoever. And so from your reporting, from interviews with the intelligence service, like what were they thinking like in that period? Like, I mean, if some journalists and bloggers saw it coming, I, it really hard for me to understand how 
the policymakers didn't see it coming. Right. So the thank you. So the re, the reporting has been that the intelligence uh, services in the United States really let down the president. Uh, that is not true. That is not how it happened. The intelligence community was raising all kinds of red flags. Um, there were more junior staffers on the National Security Council that were raising red flags. This has to do with the president. The president was very reluctant to get involved in another war. And you have to remember, he had just drawn down the troops from Iraq. He did not want a reason to uh, plus them back up again. So I think the, the decision making on this um, and the blind spots was really the president's. It was not the intelligence community. It was, it was him. Yes. Sir, thanks so much for your talk. And uh, I see your Twitter handle up there. Maybe I really ought to be tweeting this question at you. Uh, but I was wondering if you could speak to the role of social media in particular uh, in ISIS's recruitment strategy. And then maybe from your experience advising the State Department, if you might be able to shed some light on the US's efforts in countering their information campaign online. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. So the Islamic State and the media are portrayed as social media wizards, right? There's never been an organization, violent or otherwise, that has ever used Twitter uh, uh, in so effective a manner. I, I don't think that's quite right. Um, I, I think that when you take over a lot of territory and you set people on fire on camera, folks are going to look at it online. You look at a car wreck, you're going to look at the same kind of horrific stuff online. That's why they attract uh, so many eyeballs. It doesn't have a lot to do with how well they tweet, how many bots they have, any of the normal stuff that's cited. Um, the other answer to your question, what can the US government do about it? Uh, when I was at State Department, I helped set up the organization that does the online counter propaganda work. Um, and they have tried a variety of different things. They were most effective when they were just tweeting and on Facebook uh, in non-English languages. Uh, because nobody at State Department really knows non-English languages. <laughs> Western journalists don't really don't know it. And so they were left alone and they could experiment, right? But the minute that they started tweeting in English, shoo, Someone described it to me as the eye of Sauron, all of a sudden turning, <laughs> laser focused on what was going on. So everybody in the building could read it. Western journalists based in DC and New York could read it. And all of a sudden, the criticism started coming in. Some of it justified, right? Um, but the downside is that they have no more room to maneuver because everything they do is scrutinized. It's written about in the media. And then that, in turn, affects Congress. Congress gets really worked up about it, and everything grinds to a halt, which is basically where we are today. Um, but what they have tried to do um, that has not worked very well for them is to highlight the Islamic State's atrocities. The problem is that the Islamic State highlights its own atrocities. It wants people to see this stuff. Because as I said, its propaganda strategy is quite different from Al Qaeda. So when we repeat the talking points, we just help them. The better stuff we do is trying to get out the stories of people who have left the organization and can talk about its hypocrisies and what really goes on on the inside. Of course, thank you for the talk. You, you introduce yourself as someone who enjoys the history of ideas. And so I'd like to ask you about ideas, but, but of course, and unfortunately, ask you to talk about the future as opposed to history. And in fact, what I'd like to, to talk about is imagining a future 20 years from now, where for whatever reason, the, the world has seen the well-publicized collapse of this messianic organization, um, you know, then th this is now a well-known sort of thing. What sort of effect does that have on, if I can call it extremist, you know, Islam, Islamic thought? Hmm. The, I think the defeat would have to be resounding, and it would have to be long-lasting. The challenge is that 
given the instability in the region, um, there's always someone else there to try. So you, you never reach a point where the project is utterly defeated. Um, and the Islamic State itself is, is building in those uh, redundancies. But to answer your question, let's say it does happen, the hypothetical happens, and it's, and it's soundly defeated. Um, you know, I do think it takes the wind out of the sails of people who have signed on for the project. Not all of them. Uh, we've, we know from history from other apocalyptic groups, uh, the other impulse is to double down, to say we didn't try hard enough. But many more people uh, leave. Um, but my worry is that we never reach that point because of the continued instability. There's always someone, another opportunity to try. Yes. I, uh, thank you for uh, having this uh, kind of discussion. Um, uh, my name is uh, Jose, and I am a person who uh, is very well interested to know uh, we as a society, what we can do, you know, to approach this kind of situation that is not just affecting, obviously, the Muslim population, but also in a global stage, uh, to unite. What will be your thoughts, you know? Uh, what we can do as a society, including uh, or giving inclusive, you know, uh, opportunity to all people of different backgrounds to face this kind of uh, threat. Thank you. Um, so working on this kind of book, my mind is not always in the right place to answer these kind of questions about bringing people together because I focus on guys that split them apart. But I will say that I think the more that we frame this uh, effort to stop Islamic State recruitment in the West, the more we frame it as saving our young people and making sure they don't ruin their lives, um, the better off we will be. And the more we talk about it as, uh, in the same way we talk about stopping gang recruitment or recruitment to neo-Nazi groups, ext violent extremist groups of all kinds, um, the better off we will be. Um, I, my worry is that currently, at least in this country and some European countries, um, we use euphemisms to talk about the problem, like violent extremism, but what we really mean is Muslims. And um, it puts the Muslim community on edge and makes them feel like uh, uh, the government views all of them as a security threat. Um, and with good reason, because many in government do see the community as a potential threat. They're worried about the whole community radicalizing. But if you look at the community, especially in this country, Europe is a different creature, but if you look at the Muslim community in this country, very few people have gotten interested in this stuff. There have been some, right? I think I heard a number 200 people had either tried to travel abroad to join or tried to do something here. And that 200 sounds like a lot. But if you think about the millions of Muslim youth in this country, that is nothing. That's not even a statistical blip. So I think there is uh, um, uh, you know, a natural disinclination of Muslim youth to get involved with this stuff. Um, and I think the more we frame it in that way and focus our efforts to stop recruitment on people who are actually getting interested in the propaganda, tweeting about it online, talking about it on Facebook, the more we focus on them and intervening with them, the better we are, rather than framing this as a problem that a whole community is facing when it's, when it's not. Yes, and how much more time have I got for Q&A? 21? Okay, I'll go somewhere in there. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Assad, Assad dis distinguished between those rebel groups that were fighting directly against him and the Islamic State, and he took uh, ad advantage of the ISIS uh, presence in Syria. And also in response to one of the questions about the financial support of ISIS, you mentioned that those money that were coming from countries like Saudi Arabia weren't uh, basically directly going into, right. uh, I don't know, bank accounts of ISIS. Yep. Uh, 
is my my thought was that things weren't that much clear considering the timeline of the conflict in that region. Things weren't that much clear at the beginning. Maybe those countries that were against uh, uh, Assad regime, they were uh, they were more thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, collapsing the regime mm -hmm. rather than what's happening there. Mm -hmm. So maybe the monies that were going there, all the support, military support, re uh, really wasn't going to those groups and ISIS took advantage of, of that. I mean, uh, wasn't anything more kind of blurrier at that, at that point? Uh, I, that I, I don't think the money, but I will say where I do think you are right is that at least one country turned a blind eye to the foreign fighters that were streaming in to fight on behalf of ISIS, and that's Turkey. Turkey for two years just said, come on in, come on in, because they were worried about two other things more than they were worried about ISIS. Yes, ISIS a problem, but not as much of a problem as the Kurds, not as much of a problem as Assad, and they, you can see still, even though they are nominally working with the United States to go after ISIS, most of their bombings are being carried out on Kurdish positions. So in that case, in the case of manpower, I think you're, I think you're right. Yes. Hi, good evening. Uh, my question is primarily on your assessment of the U.S. military campaign against ISIS, and specifically in the context of uh, the, the discussion that's going on between using military power, mostly air power, a limited amount of ground power as a deterrent to uh, ISIS uh, as a model against other non-state uh, actors or uh, pseudo-state actors. And um, uh, if you assess ISIS foot soldiers and leadership potentially different as rational actors that can be deterred via conventional uh, military means. Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do with air power, right? and particularly when your rules of engagement are very strict. I mean, we worry a lot about civilian casualties. The Islamic State knows that and puts a lot of its personnel and materiel in urban areas. So there is not a lot you can do from the air. Um, but there's a, there's a document I talk about in the book uh, that was written by the Islamic State in 2010. And the document um, is, it's, it's really interesting, it looks like a Washington DC think tank report. And it has a series of recommendations for how the Islamic State can make a comeback, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing I might have written. Um, the thing that they focus on most over everything else, here's how we make the comeback. Here's why we screwed up before, how we do it right this time. What they focus on is winning over the Sunni Arab tribes. This is the center of gravity, they say. They identify a model for how to do that. And the model for how to win over the Sunni Arab tribes that they talk about explicitly in this text is what the Americans had done in the Ambar province. And so they go on for several pages, ah, oh, the Americans, they're infidels, but this was genius. And this was really terrible for us. And we should exactly copy what they were doing, building popular committees, having tribal militias uh, that were protecting their own people, those sorts of things. So I think whatever the mix of, of uh, uh, you know, air power, special forces we adopt, I think a big part of the ultimate solution to the ISIS uh, problem has to do with um, empowering the Sunni Arab tribes uh, to push back against the Islamic State. And maybe we have to do this by nibbling at the edges of the Islamic State, say in Syria, working with the Kurds up in the north to liberate those areas and then uh, uh, arming tribal militias. Uh, but that's, I, my guess is that's gonna be part of a more in, enduring and effective strategy against the Islamic State rather than air power. One more question. You're it. Sorry, everybody else. OK. Uh, what do you think about the fact that uh, former uh, Iraqi Ba'ath officials might have participated in ISIS and like might have directed its military operations? Yeah. Is it, they, were they really effective, or like is it something negligible? Thank you. Um, so uh, as many of you know, uh, 
the dominant party in Iraq under Saddam Hussein was a socialist party named the Ba'ath Party. And if you wanted to work in government, uh, Sunni or Shia, you had to join the Ba'ath Party. Um, now, you'll remember also that in the aftermath of the U.S. invasion, we decided to make sure that um, uh, Ba'athists uh, were no longer able to hold government office, and we disbanded the military, which in effect meant you had a lot of very senior intelligence officers and military officers that no longer had pensions and no work. And many of them got involved in the insurgency. Um, over time, a number of these men ended up in the Islamic State. And they occupy many of the senior most positions in the Islamic State. And if you think about it, it makes good sense, just from a human resources standpoint. Who has experience in running an authoritarian state in an intel service in an authoritarian state? Who has now 10 years of experience waging an, an insurgency? It's these guys, right? So they are handy to have around. The question, and I think this is part of the motive behind your question, um, is, how can these guys who are part of a socialist party sign on with this nominally ultra-Islamic project? Um, it, is, it is an enduring question, uh, but I would offer you a couple things to think about. One is that uh, many of these guys uh, came of age as officers during the early 1990s when Saddam Hussein initiated his faith campaign. And this is when, as a result of his defeat in the Iraq War, Saddam Hussein really started to emphasize Sunni identity and encourage his officers to become more religious. But even if these guys didn't get religion then, many of them did in US detainment camps. And there is one report after another of uh, these officers who had been part of the insurgency when they get to places like Camp Bucca um, of being radicalized. Uh, by the other jihadists that were already there. There was a great uh, interview with a guy I found uh, in Arabic where he's talking about all these officers that had gone through and they were reading jihadist texts with them and the Americans you know, had no idea what was being circulated. So a lot of these guys went out fully committed uh, to the cause. Um, but even say that didn't matter and these guys are just using religion cynically um, to come to power, right? One, one can't dismiss it. Um, I'd also observe that at least the guy at the top, who's a very capable leader, um, he is very committed to the cause. Uh, I wrote a, a profile of him a few weeks ago for Brookings called The Believer. Uh, the Believer was his nickname growing up as a kid because he was hyper-religious so his friends and family called him the believer. But he was also very into telling other people how to practice their faith. So he would come home, tell his sisters, tell his brothers that they're not being proper Muslims. And this desire to control other people's behavior and this interest in ultra-conservative Islam led him to become radicalized on his own by the year 2000. So three years before the US invasion, he was already a committed jihadist. And so this is the guy at the top of the organization, and it's his vision that they are really uh, realizing. Now, if he dies, maybe some of that changes and the complexion of it changes, but he's setting the overall tone. So that's it. Thank you very much for having me.